Morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today. We are about to wrap up our series on DNA. Final topic to be discussed is cell differentiation or differential gene expression. Essentially, two sides of the same coin. So let me get you your objectives, and then we'll start talking about some things. By the end of the video, here's the stuff that I need you to know. First, describe cellular processes that lead to cell differentiation. Second, understand the importance of homeotic genes in the establishment of body plan. And finally, explain the importance of the P53 gene. So here's what we got. I'm going to tell you before we even get going that this topic can be covered in excruciating depth if you are in molecular biology or something like that. We're just going to go over a overview, which is probably about all, all that you're going to need for now. So stick with me as we walk through some of this stuff. First thing to talk about is some helpful vocabulary. There's some vocabulary and some words that are used differently in this lesson than would normally be used in other lessons, so I just kind of want to get you a baseline for what the words are. First one is differentiation. All right, for today's topic, when we are talking about differentiation, we are talking about cells that are alike becoming different from one another. So if you've got two cells in your initial zygote, that are the same. One of them might become a heart cell, one of them might become a brain cell. That is differentiation. Morphogenesis is the process of actually developing a form. So in differentiation, the cells would say, hey, I'm going to be a heart or I'm going to be a brain. Morphogenesis is where the cell actually becomes a heart or becomes a brain. Cytoplasmic determinants are signals in the cytoplasm that help to determine what cell is going to be what. We'll talk about that in more detail in a second. Induction is one cell influencing another cell and helping it to decide what it is going to become, kind of like peer pressure. And finally, determination is kind of like at the end of the line. Once a cell has been determined, then it is set to become whatever cell it has been determined to become. So let's go ahead and talk about some of these things in a little more depth. If my side will click over. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so zygote to embryo, biological organization. So the whole reason that we are talking about this idea of cell differentiation is there's kind of an interesting thing to consider. Every one of your cells in your body has the exact same set of DNA in it, except for eggs or sperm. We've talked about that. But all the somatic cells in your body, they've got the exact same DNA, and yet they are all different from each other. I mean, skin cells are generally like skin cells, but skin cells aren't like muscle cells or bone cells or anything like that. So it's interesting to think that any one of your cells has the instructions to be any other type of cell, yet it is particular that it is a skin cell or a muscle cell or whatever else. So that is where we get differential gene expression, which is different genes being expressed causing different cells to do different things need to recognize this biological organization hierarchy. So you've probably heard this before, but I want you to remember that cells are organized into tissues. Tissues are organized into organs. Organs are organized into organ systems, and organ systems make up an organism. And the interesting thing is you've got like <clears throat> one type of cell or many types of cell, depending on how you look at it. At the level of a tissue, you've got kind of one type of cell, but if you look at an organ system, you got all kinds of different cells working together. So I wanted to get that organization hierarchy in your head before we moved forward. So here's differentiation and morphogenesis. And this is like, all right, so we're going to start out with our initial zygote. For the first several divisions, all the cells in the zygote are exactly the same. So it starts out as just one little zygote. And then that thing starts dividing in half and dividing in half and dividing in half and dividing in half. And it makes many divisions. I not, I'm not. i sure this number is going to be wrong, but I think it gets up beyond 64 cells or something like that before the cells actually start to become different from each other. They are all alike initially. As that process of division happens, though, we start to get the process of differentiation and morphogenesis. Differentiation is where a cell is kind of told what it's going to become. Morphogenesis is where it actually starts to become that thing. It, morpho is form, genesis means to become, so it's becoming its form. One of the ways that a cell is told what it's going to become is through cytoplasmic determinants. And this drawing here is really interesting. It's a drawing from the 50s, and it kind of talks about how this works. So right here would be our fertilized 
zygote. All right, so we've got the egg. Obviously, what you're seeing right here is the egg. What you don't see is that a sperm has come and fertilized this egg. So it's got a full set of genetic information. It hasn't started to divide yet. Um, but the thing that's being highlighted here is within the cytoplasm of the egg, the cytoplasm is not the same. And throughout this cytoplasm in the egg, some sections have got like more mRNAs or different types of mRNAs. Some have got other cytoplasmic chemicals. Just recognize that like this section right here might have a high concentration of one specific type of mRNA. As our zygote goes through and starts to divide, this chunk of cytoplasm that we originally talked about is going to get moved around as the cell goes through a couple divisions. So the first division would be right here, and then right here you can see that there's two cells. Here's one, here's the other one back here. This time it's gonna divide this way. And you can see following this yellow that as the zygote divides and becomes a blastula, that initial chunk of cytoplasm that had a high concentration of what are whatever mRNA or chemical or whatever is staying with one section of cells. That mRNA is going to signal the DNA within these cells to start turning on or turning off genes, which is going to cause those cells to become specific types of cells. So that is a cytoplasmic determinant, and it is a signal within the zygote that is telling the cells which genes to turn on and which genes to turn off. Another strategy that cells use to signal what they are to become is called induction. And this is kind of like peer pressure from other cells. So we just talked about cytoplasmic determinants inside the cell telling it what it's going to become. Once those cells start to become differentiated into what they're going to be, they can exert uh, signals to the cells that are next to them. This might look like signaling each other through uh, cell membrane receptors. It might look like sending out growth factors. Either of those things could cause the cells next to each other to start to become the same type of cell. So you could have, let's say right here, you have got a brain cell right here, undifferentiated, undifferentiated. This one might continue down the path to a skin cell, but this one could send some signals over towards that one, causing it to also become a brain cell. So that would be induction. Once we go from actually differentiating our cells into what they're going to become and starting to, you know, get their morphogenesis starting to become their cells, we get pattern formation. And there are a set of genes called positional genes, and they set up the body axis. What I mean by body axis is they tell the developing embryo where front and back, right and left, up and down is. Now, the picture I've got on the right is of a Drosophila embryo, a fruit fly embryo. And the reason we got that up is when it comes to genes helping to form body plan is one of the best studied and best understood organism. So you can see that there's all those little like fluorescent bands across the larva or the embryo. Those are different genes that have been labeled by researchers and as those genes are expressed they take up different positions on the body. So know that pattern formation is setting up right, left, front, back, up, down, all that good stuff and positional genes are responsible for doing that. More specifically, there's a set of genes called homeotic genes, and I'm going to put this down real quick because you'll see it a lot. Homeotic genes are also known as Hox genes, and Hox genes are responsible for setting up like body segmentation. So our pattern genes set up front, back, right, left, up, down. Homeotic genes determine, all right, here's where air, eggs, here's where ears are going to be, neck, chest, arms, legs, etc. Interesting thing is, homeotic genes are pretty consistent from one organism to the next. So right here, they show you a human chromosome. Here's a fly chromosome. And they have color-coded all of the different homeotic genes. And you can see in the fruit fly, the red homeotic gene tells where the proboscis is going to be. In humans, it tells where years are going to be. Now, there's one gene for that in a fruit fly. There are three genes for that in humans. And then as you look down the rest of this thing, like the blue genes right here, signal for where the wings and the thorax are going to be. The thorax is like the chest of the fruit fly, and it shows where the chest is going to be in humans. So as our embryo is developing, these homeotic genes are turning on and saying, all right, this part of the embryo is going to become a chest, this will become an ear, this will become a leg, this will become like a face. 
And it's kind of interesting to think, evolutionarily speaking, that the same genes are present in most other organisms that have got a pretty set and determined body plan. Final two things I want to talk about today is cancer um, and genes that protect against cancer. So essentially cancer is a form of cell determination or gene differentiation. Um, different genes are being expressed causing cells, cancer cells, or regular cells to become cancer cells. Two terms to know in this. An oncogene is a gene that causes a cell to become cancerous. A proto-oncogene is a healthy gene. So it's a pre-cancerous gene. What you see here on the right hand side is they are showing you some sort of normal cell right here. So the DNA that is in the cell, it is presently a proto-oncogene. It is a healthy set of DNA. You get some sort of mutagen right here. They're showing you radioactivity, and that breaks the DNA. Once that DNA gets broken, it's going to self-adhere or self-repair. It's going to stick itself back together. But when it sticks itself back together, it might do that in such a way that the genetic material gets severely broken, which would lead to this normal gene becoming an oncogene. That oncogene then is going to start doing all of the things that we talked about happens in cancer cells. You are going to lose anchorage dependence. You're going to lose density uh, dependent inhibition. This thing could start secreting growth factors. The genes have become broken and genes start being expressed that cause our happy normal cell to become a cancer cell that just replicates out of control and starts influencing all of its friends that are around it. Now our body does have a guardian to be known to, that you should know about. There is a gene called the P53 gene. It is also known as the guardian angel gene. What it is, is it's a tumor suppressor gene. It's present in the cells of our body, and it's essentially there to guard against broken cells getting out of control. It's like a regulator or a quality control gene or whatever. It essentially like if DNA breaks in the cell, it ensures that things get straight before that cell further divide. So there are a couple things that it can do. Um, on one end of things, it can inhibit the cell cycle. So we talked about checkpoints in the cell cycle. If a cell gets to one of those checkpoints and the P53 gene says, nope, you are broken, it can cause a couple things to happen to shut down that cell cycle. It could bind to cyclin, and we talked about cyclin causing the cell go to go into mitosis. So if P53 binds to cyclin and that cyclin is not there, our cell is not going to go along. So that gives it the cell time to repair the broken DNA. It can also synthesize miRNA, which is microRNA, which can bind to DNA and slow down the cell cycle as well. So those two strategies are strategies P53 uses to give the cell time to let the machinery within the uh, replication transcription mechanisms fix the DNA. If the DNA cannot be fixed, P53 sends the cell into apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. It says, nope, we're not going to get fixed. It would be better if the cell just dies. So it will go ahead and kill off that cell and thus protecting us from cancer. I hope that this little tutorial on cell differentiation slash differential gene expression was helpful. Thank you for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. We'll see you again.